Hello friends! Welcome to The Buzz. This episode will inspire you to plant your own pollinator patch, visit a preserve that has lots of recreation activities, history, and wildlife. Plus, we'll give you tips on how to take on composting. So get ready to fly like a butterfly and pollinate like a bee on this episode of The Buzz. Welcome to McKinley Woods, located in Shanahan. This preserve was purchased in 1931 and is a little over 500 acres, and it's nestled between the DuPage River and the Des Plaines River, making it perfect for a wildlife sanctuary. There are two access points, one being Frederick's Grove and the other Cary Sheraton Grove. Both are rich in history. Plus, this is the location of our Four Rivers Environmental Education Center that is making history of its own. McKinley Woods also connects to the INM Canal State Trail, which travels from Rockdale to LaSalle. This trail is great to recreate on. You can either just hike, I've seen runners, bikers, and it has perfect little stops along the way to really take in the wildlife. Right now, I'm hearing tons of birds in the canopy. I even hear a bullfrog right off in the water here. And it's just great all seasons. You can see fungus in the fall. When the leaves are gone, picture all those big birds of prey you can see way easier. And right now, I even found an animal sign. This is definitely from a beaver. They kind of chip these trees down and make them look like sharp pencil points. If you visit our forest preserves, you'll notice picnic shelters scattered throughout. But if you come to Frederick's Grove, you may notice one is not like the others. Exploring this preserve, you'll see the legacy left behind from the Civilian Conservation Corps that were active in the 1930s. President Franklin Roosevelt created the CCC as a way to promote environmental and conservation projects. It also was a way to give work opportunities to a country that was devastated by the Great Depression. This program recruited men from 18 to 25, would train them, and then ship them to camps across the country. They worked eight-hour shifts, and then in the evening would take classes ranging from topics like literature to welding. Over its nine years of existence, this program trained about 400,000 illiterate men to read and write. In Illinois, we had about 50 camps throughout the state, including one here at McKinley Woods. This stone shelter is a remnant from the camp. The men worked here and along the canal, building trails, comfort facility, more picnic shelters and boat docks, along with planting trees and shrubs. As the program intended, things slowed down as men found higher paying opportunities in the workforce. And by 1942, the CCC camp closed. Just a few years later, McKinley Woods would be needed again by the federal government. At the end of World War II, about 500 prisoner of war camps were being established across the country. In 1945, the Forest Preserve agreed to make improvements on McKinley Woods CCC camp to take in 350 German POWs from a crowded camp in Cook County. The camp was named Camp Brandon Morris, and according to the Herald newspaper, the men that were enlisted worked as typists and in their free time indulged in some sporting activities. Local companies like Joliet Chemicals and Joliet Industrial also took advantage of these POWs to help with their workforce. And after two months, this camp did close down. The barracks stood empty for another decade until 1957 when the Forest Preserve hired Arthur Olin Sage to be a custodian for the property. He was also deputized as a Will County Sheriff's Police Officer to get training on how to handle any kind of situations he may encounter. He was paid $60 a week, which in today's money would be $617. His family was also able to live in one of the old CCC barracks. We learned what living here in McKinley Woods was like from the youngest daughter of the family, Luann, who was three years old when the family moved in. The barracks were small. There was a living room, a kitchen, and two bedrooms. They had cold running water and a coal stove that later got upgraded to a propane gas stove and a television, but it had spotty reception. Luann remembers her father hard at work on mowing, painting, and constructing picnic tables, a lot of time using his own tools from his farm in Shanahan. 
But between these hardworking moments, there were some times of entertainment. She remembers when the canal towpath would be flooded in the winter, creating their own little pond to skate on. She remembers that her father would call this a bayou. The children had a pitch in as well. When her father declared they were going into town on wintry days, all the kids took cinders along the steep long road so the car could get traction to get out, which I totally believe because this is the same road that we have to shut down every winter. In 1973, Arthur Sage retired from the Forest Preserve at the age of 75. He packed up his home of 16 years and moved to Shorewood. Later in 1987, he passed away at the age of 89. Walking along the trails, you may still see the remnants of the CCC camp. This little area in the fall is much more noticeable where you can see the foundation. Here in the spring and summer, the plants have kind of reclaimed their land. Today you may not be able to live in a wooden barrack, but Frederick's Grove does offer four primitive campsites for family and group rentals. Camp where there's been so much history, and plus enjoy shoreline fishing and a kayak launch along the canal. For those hikers who like their boots a little dirty, Frederick's Grove has about two miles of dirt trails. These are great to explore as they give you a little activity going up and down ravines. If you need a break, there are some scenic spots along the way with benches to take in the views of the river and the canal. Prior to the Forest Preserve securing the Cary Sheraton Grove access, this land was once a public resort, then later owned privately, and the locals still call this Moose Island. The house was behind us, but we reconstructed it to be the Four Rivers Environmental Education Center. And this is actually where my story starts with the Forest Preserve. In the back, there's still a house that I once lived in for a whole year. Five years worth of interns lived here while participating in the Naturalist Teaching Fellowship. The program no longer exists, but this building still gets used by visitor services and operations staff. I have so many great memories here. Living in a forest preserve is truly a special thing. I remember an owl hooting here during twilight and then being woken up at 3 a.m. with coyotes yipping and howling, it seemed like right here in this yard. We hiked the trails every day to see all the seasonal changes and even got to put kayaks in the river to kayak amongst the huge American lotus plants, which I had no idea what they were at the time. I also saw my first American white pelican here, and I remember my jaw dropping in the wintertime seeing all the bald eagles that would visit. The best part is that my memories are still being brought to life with programs at Four Rivers. The Interpretive Naturalist staff host so many different opportunities, from wildflower hikes to night hikes with owls and even evening paddling. They also host larger events like Eagle Watch that happens every year in January. Plus, this is also a wedding venue. So have your wedding dreams come true with views of the water, trees, and everything serene. Cary Sheraton Grove also features a canoe and kayak launch you'll put in here at the DuPage River and it connects to the Des Plaines River for a full day of paddling fun. But wait, there's more. The Four Rivers team has been hard at work giving updates to the building indoors and the campus outdoors. Outside, there's an all-persons trail that has a paved access with interactive signs down to this pond. And inside, there's going to be new exhibits, including a huge fish tank to show off some local wildlife. Keep tabs on our progress by checking our website and Facebook pages for more information. McKinley Woods truly has a little bit of everything. The CCC structures echo the preserve's fascinating history. The trails wind through a variety of habitat with wildlife to see along the way. You can camp for a weekend, go fishing, even kayak. 
Plus, make sure you visit Four Rivers Environmental Education Center to see all the changes and to talk to the naturalists about the best places to explore. Do you want to do more to protect nature, inspire discovery, and connect people with the great outdoors? You can when you support the Nature Foundation of Will County. This nonprofit charity raises funds through support from donors, organizations, and the business community to help support the Forest Preserve District of Will County's mission. The foundation helps various initiatives take flight. It helps the Forest Preserve secure national touring exhibitions. It pays for new amenities such as campground welcome stations and bike repair stations on Will County's regional trails. It assists with the costs associated with land stewardship, which includes equipment for volunteer workdays and seeding of native plants to restore the land to its original state, which helps enhance not only your outdoor experiences, but local wildlife as well. There's a lot more work to be done, and we're just getting started. Roll with us on this adventure and become a champion for nature so future generations can appreciate and explore everything Mother Nature has to offer. Donate today at willcountynature.org. Let's talk about trash. Most households are recycling, but are you ready to take your recycling up to the next level? You can divert even more trash out of the landfills by composting. It's not as complicated as you think, nor as gross and as stinky. With these quick tips, you'll become a composting pro, have rich soil for your yard, and help save the earth in the process. There are some amazing benefits to composting. First off, it can take out as much as 30% of your household waste from your garbage can. That means you're taking out the trash less, but it also has some huge impacts on the landfill. When organic material makes it to the landfill, it doesn't have enough space to naturally decompose. Instead, it makes a harmful methane gas. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, this methane gas is a greenhouse gas, and it's actually 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide of trapping heat in the atmosphere. Put that organic matter to better use by creating rich humus for your yard and gardens for free. It will provide nutrients for your plants as well as retain the moisture in the soil and it helps reduce the need for chemicals found in other costly fertilizers. The type of composter you have will determine what can go in it, but generally it's all about balancing your carbons and your nitrogens. The carbons is what we call brown materials and this includes Nitrogen is what we call the green materials, and this includes... Generally, you wanna keep more brown carbons than green nitrogens. So think one-third greens versus two-thirds brown. When in doubt, if the compost is acting a little stinky, just add more carbon. There are a few general do's and don'ts of what goes in a composter. There are detailed lists you can find online, but here's a few items that you should avoid. There are a lot of different types of composters, so it's just up to you on what fits your lifestyle. If you have a small amount of space, try a worm bin. If you want something with easy upkeep, try a compost tumbler. If you have more room in your yard, try a bin system. It's important for every system that you give your compost pile a turn every few weeks. This helps aerate the compost, giving a boost of oxygen. Aeration speeds up the decomposition process. So if you have a worm bin, toss it with your hands. If you have a tumbler, give it a spin. And if you have bins, grab a shovel or a pitchfork to turn them over. One last tip is about the process from table to compost. We recommend using a small little bin to put in your fridge and store all your compost. 
Once it's full, take it to a bucket and shovel. This is where you wanna kinda of pound it and get it chopped up into small pieces. Small pieces will help avoid animals getting curious on if there's a meal and also make more surface area so your earthworms or microbes have more room to spread out and get eating. After you've added all your scraps, it's good to make sure you cover them. So if you're in a worm bin, add a layer of newspapers. If you're outside, turn your compost. For our tumbler, we're just gonna give it a spin. And voila, you have composted. If you need inspiration, head to Plum Creek Nature Center to visit their compost trail to give you ideas and ways to have a composter for any home and any budget. Warmer weather is here and picnic season is in full swing. Chances are a lot of items in your basket are brought to you with the help of pollinators, possibly even the blanket you sit on. In Illinois, 85% of plants, including 150 crops, need pollination. Everything from tomatoes to chocolate to tea, even fibers and medicine. Not to mention, pollinators keep the ecosystem alive, from plants providing food, shelter, oxygen, to the other animals higher in the food chain, including us. So let's take a moment to learn about these literal busy bees and their pollinator pals. I say it all the time here on The Buzz, but everything in nature is connected. You take one link out of the chain and the whole thing weakens. You may have been hearing a lot about pollinators recently because their populations are declining. Researchers are trying to find the exact cause, but there's a lot of factors at play. They believe that loss of habitat, pesticides and diseases, and competition with non-native species could affect all these populations. So what? There's a lot of bugs in the world. Well, if these pollinators are declining, that means there's gonna be less viable seeds for the plants to reproduce. Less plants means less food for the animals and us. So again, it's all kind of connected. Some of these plants have unique relationships with animals. For example, the monarch butterflies and milkweed. Milkweed is their host plant, which means the monarch butterfly only lays its egg on milkweed and the caterpillars exclusively eat only that plant. So without milkweed, no monarch butterflies. But have no fear, there are ways to help. From young to old to homeowners to apartment dwellers, working together, we can all make a difference. The first step is understanding what pollination is all about. Let's break down pollination. Basically, it's how a plant reproduces. Most plants have flowers with petals that attract the pollinators to the good stuff, the pollen and nectar. Now, to us, the petals may just be one color, but some pollinators, like bees, can see an ultraviolet. And to them, the petals look completely different. There's colorful landing strips pointing them right to the center of the plant. The pollen is housed on these anthers, and the goal is to get that pollen dust to the center, to the sticky stigma. Once it's on here, it can be transported down to the ovary of the plant where fertilization can occur. That will yield a seed or a fruit. Now, depending on the plant, the pollen either needs to be mixed within the same flower, a flower on the same plant, or a different flower on a different plant, but of the same species. This is where the pollinators come into action. Now, they're not actually pollinating on purpose because nothing in life is for free. The plant knows this. So the plant is offering delicious sweet nectar and that's what they're really after. They're there for a meal to either eat the nectar and sometimes the pollen to feed themselves or to their young. So when they're getting the nectar, they're kind of bopping around the flower and get dust in the pollen and then move to the next flower and boom, win-win situation. How many pollinators do you think you can name? Bees tend to get all the credit, but in Illinois, there are a lot more members of the club. Think of bees, butterflies, beetles, ants, flies, hummingbirds are all doing their part. Globally, bats are important to that list because they're responsible for pollinating the plants that make chocolate, bananas, and agave if you like tequila.
European honeybees may be the most well-known bee, but there's actually 400 to 500 native bees in Illinois, including bumblebees, mason bees, sweat bees, and so much more. And they're going to the flower to eat the pollen as well as the nectar. They'll take that pollen back to feed themselves or their young. They also take part in something called flower constancy, which means that they visit one flower type on one trip. So that means that species is really getting pollinated that day. Bees tend to be hairy, and this is on purpose because they can collect all that pollen on their bodies. Then they'll take their legs and move it down to the stiffer hairs on the bottom of their legs, also called pollen baskets. If you want to help bees, including our state endangered rusty patch bumblebee, you can become involved with beespotter.org. It is run by the University of Illinois and helps researchers find where the bees are by people submitting in photos of bees in their yards, neighborhoods, preserves, and really anywhere you explore. Butterflies are not as efficient pollinators as bees are because they don't have the same hairy body parts to carry the pollen. However, they need energy to fly, and that comes from nectar. So when they visit flower to flower, they're still moving around some of that pollen. And they can fly longer and further than bees, so they're covering a larger area of plants. Butterflies like larger flowers that are round like a landing pad. But they can also handle those plants that are clustered flowers like goldenrod. They can also see more color, like red, yellow, and oranges. And remember, some butterflies have host species, just like that monarch in the milkweed. So by planting a lot of different diversity in your yard, you can attract even more butterflies. Generally, when the sun goes down, moths take their turn to come out and pollinate. But there is one group of moths that are active during the day, and you may get them confused because they look like cute little baby hummingbirds. This group is called hawk moths, and they're excellent flyers hovering from plant to plant. And what looks like a beak is actually their long tongue collecting the nectar. And their caterpillars are pretty recognizable too. Have you ever seen those big, plump tomato hornworms in your garden? Well, those will turn into these beautiful hawk moths. Beetles are the largest order in the animal kingdom and make up 40% of the known insects. Beetles are also reported to be the oldest pollinators, being found at the same time where the dinosaurs roamed. Now, beetles use their smell to find flowers, and not all flowers have to smell pretty. Beetles are attracted to like musky, uh, over-ripened fruit, a little decay smell. These plants have also adapted thicker leaves and petals because the beetles tend to chew their way into the center. Insects aren't the only ones pollinating. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are also interested in that delicious nectar. They're attracted to tube-shaped flowers and like the colors red and orange. When they stick their long bills in, they also get a face full of pollen before they dart to the next flower. And they're hungry. Their heart pumps 1,200 times per minute while their wings beat 70 times per second. To keep up with their fast lifestyle, they have to eat about every 10 to 15 minutes, visiting 1,000 to 2,000 flowers per day, eating about half the amount of their weight. Added bonus is that all those flowers are getting pollinated. Now that you know about pollination and the pollinators, there's one more thing you have to do. All these native pollinators are gonna need native plants. So plant your own pollinator patch in your yard, in your neighborhood garden, or even in containers on your apartment's deck. The best place to find native plants is at native plant sales versus the box stores that can still use some pesticides on their plants. Luckily, our Nature Foundation of Will County is having a summer native plant sale starting in July. So make sure you order online to get your native habitat started now.
summer is here, so go ahead and make a splash with your friends. Kayaking is a perfect activity for getting together with others, whether you prefer the wide open water of a fishing lake, an upstream paddle in a flowing river, or the calm of the I&M Canal. We have plenty of scenic places sure to float your boat. Embrace a sense of adventure. Take your time to check out wildlife along the way. There are new surprises around every bend. The open water is calling your name. Make this year be the one you get out and explore Will County's waterways. Grab your kayak, round up a few friends, and soak up the summer fun. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org. From seeds brought to life from pollination, to those plants thriving in the wilds of McKinley Woods, and to all of it becoming recycled in compost, nature's life cycle keeps going. Join this life cycle by mapping your next adventure at McKinley Woods or learning what native plants to bring into your yard. Head to reconnectwithnature.org for all your nature needs. I hope to see you at the next native plant sale, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.